All right, hello, hello. It's nice to see the numbers starting to tick up here in the attendee list. And welcome to the folks joining us on the live stream. We'll just get it, give it uh, 30 seconds or so before we kick off in earnest, but it's always good to learn about who you are and where you're tuning in from. I am tuning in or I'm coming to you from a walk-in closet uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, um, as my house is under construction. All right, hello to the new folks. We'll just give it another few seconds and I will kick things off in earnest. And hello to the folks on the live stream on LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube as well. And this is being recorded. I think you were warned if you saw this uh, on Zoom. And so we'll post this afterwards in case you have to jump off or you miss anything. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off formally. Hello and welcome to One Designer, One Work, a monthly content series from AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. My name is Li Shan Huang. I am the Director of Design Content and Learning here at AIGA. And I'd just like to take a moment to thank you, our members. AIGA is a member supported organization and your continued support means the whole world to us for making programming like this possible, making it available for the entire design community. And if you're not a member or this is your very first AIGA event, I wanted to welcome you in particular and invite you to become a member over at AIGA.org where you can learn more about our membership. All right, with that, Sales pitch aside, also a friendly reminder about our code of conduct because we are streaming live and this is the internet. Um, I have to say it, keep it kind, keep it professional and we'll be problem free. If you want to refer to the fine print of that, check that out on our website as well. We have had a problem free streak for a long time so we're gonna keep it that way, but I have to say that. All right, now on to our main program. This is One Designer, One Work, where one designer every month presents a work or a body of work that is personally meaningful to them. And our guest presenter today is Adam Swift Lucas. He's a graphic designer, publisher, and educator. He runs Specific Ideas, a multidisciplinary creative practice, which consists of two parts, the studio, a graphic design studio that seeks to create new structures for ideas through the meticulous arrangement of text and image. And then the second part, the press, a small independent publishing house that pursues a holistic creative process, providing care and consideration to the concept, design, typography, and production of each publication. Currently, Adam is also an assistant professor of graphic design at Kansas City Art Institute and one half of New New New. I think I got that right. It's new new times. Yeah. It's new, 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 an art and design initiative that he runs with his partner, Rachel Ferber. Adam today will explore the book design of Walter Hamadi. Hamadi was a Midwest based Lebanese American book artist, graphic designer, publisher, poet, and educator. His experimental approach to book design is an inspirational example of how one can find opportunities for creativity and play within established conventions. So over to Adam, and I'll come back to host the Q&A. But as always, you can type your questions in the Q&A pod or type it in the chat, and we'll surface them, time permitting. All right, over to you, Adam. Thanks so much, Lishan. Thanks, Miriamie. All right, just going to share my screen here. Okay, um, so I'm hoping, I can't see anyone, so I'm hoping everyone's seeing the um, opening slide, which is just my information. Um, before I begin, uh, there are a bunch of thank yous uh, I have in store. Um, first, I wanna give a big thanks in advance to Ruth Lingen. Uh, Ruth is a master printer and book artist who co-runs Line Press Limited in Dumbo, New York. Uh, in the early 80s, Ruth studied under Walter Hamady, the central figure of my talk, and served as his studio assistant as well. She gave an excellent presentation on Hamady and his work in 2016 
at, uh, type, at Cooper entitled The Typographical Genius of Walter Homedy. Uh, and that I highly recommend that talk, especially if your interest is piqued um, from mine. Um, it is uh, a really um, wonderful presentation of a lot of expert insights and um, experience. Um, so since Hamadi's books are very rare and difficult to acquire, um, I often relied on screenshots from Ruth's talk when putting together this presentation. Uh, I also incorporated several of her observations into my talking points as well. So thank you, Ruth, for providing such an invaluable resource. Um, I want to thank AIGA for the opportunity to present today and for being such a consistent source of support uh, for the design community in so many ways, particularly for students. I want to thank Prockett Horn for the nomination to speak. Um, it's quite an honor. And finally, thanks to everyone who's tuned in today. Um, and in the future, if you're watching a recording of this, it's a real privilege to be here sharing my thoughts with you. So I like to begin by setting the scene. I'm beaming myself to you from Kansas City, Missouri. Um, this is the skyline. Uh, although at the same time, it's important to acknowledge that this land is that traditional ancestral and unceded territory of many indigenous nations, including the Kickapoo, the Ka, the Osage, the Shawnee, the Nutashi, and Uchaiti Shako Ween or Sioux tribes. So as many of you probably know, Kansas City is located pretty much smack dab in the middle of the country. Um, it's in what many folks uh, call for better or for worse flyover country. And as you can see, it's very much uh, located in the Midwest. I'd say it's very solidly uh, a Midwest city. So I went to college, uh, studied undergrad in Ohio, which at the time I thought was also solidly Midwest. Um, I grew up um, on the East Coast. So going to school eight hours West to me was Midwest. Um, but one of the things I learned upon moving to Kansas City is that most Missourians actually consider Ohio to be East or at least definitely not solidly Midwest. Uh, one person literally laughed at me when I told them I had lived in the Midwest before because I had lived in Ohio. Uh, and um, by the way, this is uh, the first image result from a Google search for, quote, Midwestern person laughing, which uh, I won't read into it, but um, it's interesting to see. So a couple of fun facts about Kansas City. Um, its official nickname is the City of Fountains because it is said to have more fountains than any city in the world except for Rome. Uh, it also happens to have a lot of boulevards, a boulevard being the green way or green space between two roadways. Um, so many that strangely enough, it also is said to have uh, more boulevards than any city in the world except Paris. So based on those two data points, this is kind of the overall rankings we're looking at. Um, so Kansas City is doing, doing pretty all right. Um, so I moved to Kansas City in 2018 for a full-time faculty position um, at Kansas City Art Institute. And that's where I teach now. This is a um, photograph of part of the campus. Really beautiful here. Um, it's really a, a wonderful place and I get to spend a lot of time with wonderful people. Um, these are my colleagues. Uh, this is from 2018, where we hosted a Bauhaus themed party. Um, and our newest colleague, Eager, um, I added recently in a crude Photoshop in the background. Eager, sorry about that, but I'm glad you could join us. So, since moving to Kansas City, uh, one question I've been fascinated by is what distinguishes Midwestern design? And this is really the core question that I'll explore in my talk today. I'll poke and pry into it and suggest some thoughts I've had and findings I've come across, mainly revolving around one person. 
and that's this man, Walter Hamadi. I have no idea what uh, the bird's nest is doing on his head, but I, I think it's a really good look. Um, so before I talk about who he was and what he did, um, the many amazing things he did, um, I want to explain first how I uh, found him. So um, in Kansas City, there's a really great used bookstore called Prospero's. This is a picture of the exterior. And inside, uh, as you can see, it's a um, really magical place. There's piles upon piles and rows upon rows of books of all sorts. Um, and I was perusing the art and design sections one afternoon, which happens to be the right image next to the ladder, that whole area. And I came across a spine that caught my eye, which looked like this. Um, it, as you can see, it featured uh, an unusual, but I'd say well-crafted typesetting of two justified lines of Cooper Black uh, set in smaller than normal title case interspersed with sharp red slashes. So it was, I thought, just a strange treatment of a spine and of typography in general, um, but strange in a good way. Uh, the title, Jack Earl, The Genesis and Triumphant Survival of an Underground Ohio Artist, continued to pique my interest, so I pulled it off the shelf. So the cover featured more Cooper um, in an even more charming size and an alluring image of a ceramic figure that seemed to me as an unmistakably some sort of Midwestern character, but I wasn't sure who or what this person was or what it was supposed to be. A farmer the artist knew? Was it the author? Was it the artist himself? And why in the world does this person have a carrot as a finger? I was intrigued to say the least. So opening up to the interior, I was a bit surprised and maybe even a little bit disappointed to find a majority of the book to look more like a novel or journal than a monograph. There was a section of color plates of the artist's work in the back, but 230 of the 300 pages looked pretty much like this. Longish justified lines of Cheltenham with little pencil spot illustrations kind of sprinkled throughout. And most curiously, the page numbers were reproduced from handwriting. So in terms of design moves, I was kind of just baffled by this book so far. It was typographically and formally just unusual. So I, I, was, I was intrigued again. And um, as is my designer tendency with most books, I immediately turned to the end of the book to search for the call font to see if I could find the designer. And as you may have guessed, I found out that it was our friend Walter. So um, at the time, of course, I had never heard of Walter Hamidi, um, but needless to say, I was excited to look further into him and into his work. And, you know, based on what I was seeing with this book, I was excited by maybe could this person hold the answers to my larger question of what distinguishes Midwestern design. So Walter Hamidi was born in 1940 in Flint, Michigan. Uh, descended from Lebanese Druze immigrants. Um, he was a book artist, a graphic designer, an educator, a publisher, a master letterpress printer, printer a paper maker, and poet, and probably many other things that aren't in his bios that I can could find. Um, while studying at Cranbrook in 1964, Hamidi launched the Perishable Press Limited, a small independent press through which he published 131 volumes of hand handmade books over his and its life. Um, he was also an esteemed faculty member at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for 30 years. And just as you can see, an all around super fascinating dude. A uh, cool AIGA fact about Hamidi, on 13 occasions since 1967, the Perishable Press Limited has received AIGA's 50 Best Books of the Year Award. 13 different occasions. It's pretty, um, pretty amazing uh, merit there. So the first area of Hamidi's work that I want to highlight is how he took advantage of the multidisciplinary nature of his creative practice. 
how he exploited the intersectional opportunities that arose from his various roles as graphic designer, printer, and publisher, especially, and even at times as a writer and editor too. So perhaps the most famous illustration of this was Hamidi's approach to colophons. As many of you know, traditionally a colophon is a brief section at the end of a publication that provides factual information about the production de details, who designed it, where it was printed, etc. Hamidi used colophons as a space to wax poetic, to ruminate on his current thoughts and to tell an elaborate story about the making of the book almost as if it was a personal journal entry or essay. So for example, this colophon here, um, it is obviously way longer than normal colophons and appears formally different. Most colophons kind of look like a list because it's just factual information line by line. Here he's set a full large paragraph of text and I'll read an excerpt from it. Quote, Work on the book was delayed and made discontinuous by gestation and delivery of our printer's devil, then repeated mushroom and berry forges, gardening, canning, etc., logs to the sawmill, stonewall building and copious company to say nothing about mother nature's free use of tornado, wind, once in a lifetime ice storm, and now drought. So as we await the locust, sweeping fire, earthquake with flood, we finish this text part after the solstice and before the zephyrs, unquote, and on and on. And so you can see even the language he's using is, is really verbose, is really um, poetical in a way, um, and the opposite of what colophons are normally um, used as. Um, other things to point out here, the typesetting of the colophon is really a remarkable example of full justification typesetting. Note that there are no hyphens nor any rivers. Um, Hamidi was an obsessive typesetter. Um, and, you know, one caveat here, just to remind you, this is all handset letterpress. Everything you're going to be seeing is, is that. Um, he's really obsessive typesetter overall, but of justified text in particular. And one of the ways he was able to achieve such a result was his editorial and or authorial control over the text itself. Right, he was known to even recompose lines, rewrite lines while setting the type. Um, also, if you look closely, you can see a little blind debossment of the edition number below the colophon. Um, of course, that is going to be changing every single book, as is a lot of text in the colophon, because Hamidi actually would write custom lines about the making of that exact exact book in the colophon, even though there was an edition of 125 books, each book was unique. So in some of his books, the text of the colophon was longer than the text of the entire book. Like in this fifth iteration of Hamidi's Gabber Jab series, which was a self-initiated series of books that explore and reflect on the book form. Um, Again, note the exquisite justified typesetting and the unique edition number. Um, and you know, these are these are the kind of things that Hamidi would write in a way that was just such an outpouring of energy and investment of time. It's really just um, awe inspiring. One final call for an example um, that I'll show you in this publication of short poems and delicate illustrations. Hamidi took a more restrained approach to his colophon, treating it more like a poem itself with sensitive line breaks and quiet typography. So just like any good designer in terms of designing uh, in response to the content and being appropriate, um, you know, how many didn't necessarily abuse his, his position as this um, designer, printer, writer, editor of the colophon, he was respectful of the, of the context. So personally, I find Hamidi's approach to Kalfan super meaningful and inspirational. Um, I'm a graphic designer who runs the publishing studio through which many of the projects I publish, I also design, print, and produce myself. And many of those projects are self-initiated for which I make all the content too. Um, like this is a series of um, photography booklets uh, I'm showing here. So there are many intersections between those processes wherein I feel there are ample opportunities to make and shape meaning in valuable ways. And I feel like 
learning from Hamidi and how he handled his intersections of all of his roles, it's really inspirational to think about, okay, how could I also leverage those overlaps? So applying this thinking to what it means to be a designer right now here in the Midwest, if I'm being honest, I simply wouldn't have the time, space, and resources if I was back in New York or in Portland, which are places um, I had lived and worked before. Um, in concrete terms, the Midwest has provided access to large affordable studio space, the resources to acquire various necessary printing and production tools, and perhaps most importantly, it's provided the time and space for deeper dives into thinking and making within the intersections of my practice. And I'm gonna go back to that idea at the end of this talk um, in terms of that depth that one is able to achieve and, and the, the necessity of it. Another source of influence that I found in, in Hamandi is, is this deep interest and investment in the book form as an accessible medium for artistic ideas. Um, this is an excerpt from an essay he wrote um, about the book, um, and I'll just read it. Uh, the book as a structure is the Trojan horse of art. It is not feared by average people. It is a familiar form in the world and average people will take it from you and examine it whereas a painting, poem, sculpture, or print, they will not. So this concept is really building from a deep legacy of thinking and making around artist books. One notable source being the seminal 1976 artist books issue of Artright, the cover you can see here, in which numerous artists of the time whose practices involve bookmaking comment on the meaning of artist books, many of which whom echo Hamidi's thoughts from before. Still, there's an important distinction to call out here. One of the fundamental traits of an artist book uh, of artist books and arguably a defining characteristic of any Trojan horse is accessibility. In other words, the, su the success of a Trojan horse depends on if it reaches enough people. In the context of artist books, it's about the ability of the book to be distributed, right? Um, disseminated and circulated. And it's about the conveyance of that information. It's not about the precious preciousness of the object. And to quote Pat Steer from this same issue, um, artist books are portable, durable, inexpensive, intimate, non-precious, re replicable, historical, and universal. This is an ethos I personally subscribe to. So while I find Hamidi and his work inspirational, I'm also at odds with it, or I, I at least question it. It, it leads me to ask, is Hamidi being contradictory, right? All of the books he made were extremely rare. They're extremely precious, still are. And they weren't made to be distributed cheaply, nor transported easily, nor viewed widely. If I put aside my biases though, I suppose this train of thought leads me to a different, more productive question why is Ham Hamidi being contradictory? And does it even matter if he is? So besides the obvious constraints of letterpress printing, um, these questions, they might very well point to Hamidi as the poet and artist, the introspective interior Hamidi, someone who could care less if anyone interacts with his exquisite books or reads his thoughtful writing someone who makes things for the sake of making them, which although cliche is true, it's really that is about creativity in its purest form. And might this also be a distinguishing trait of Midwestern design, a willingness and even desire for relative obscurity, an obscurity in which one can pursue ideas without the distraction of constant tension and the anxiety of influence. Could those traits also be part of what makes Midwestern design what it is and what it, when it can be successful. So um, a great place to observe this in Hamidi's work is in his experimentation and rule breaking, which would often result in genuinely innovative design moves. Title pages, oddly enough, were places where Hamidi often experimented um, because he was bold. Uh, here, 
Um, while it could be easily missed or taken as a misprint, if you look closely, you can see that the text is printed in at least two subtly different shades of dark gray, maybe three. It's hard to, hard to see from this photograph. Um, this move, paired with the fact that he set the text tightly tracked, all lowercase, suggests the reader, at least for me, to slow down. It's asking the reader to pay closer attention in order to notice the hierarchy, in order to understand the emphasis. Or on this title page, within the two title case words, he mixes Roman with italic letter forms. That's a move I really haven't seen much of before. You can see in the same thing uh, clearer here. For me, this is creating an effect where there's an anchor to the words that happen if, it, if they were set, um, that happen more if uh, now with the mix of Roman and italic versus if they were fully set in italic. Um, and I think he did that to kind of create a visual anchor on the page. Here, Hamidi is experimenting with show through uh, by printing on Sekishu, a very thin Japanese paper. Uh, the illustration that looks like it's printed behind the text on the same side is actually printed on the reverse side of this page. Keep in mind, this was something avoided, if not frowned upon, in traditional fine letterpress printing and bookmaking. So Hamidi here, again, intentionally breaking the rules, intentionally breaking from tradition. There are also title pages and half title pages that showcase his play with legibility, um, like this one where you may likely miss the title, which is set more like a strange header pinched up into the top margin right on the actual um, edge of the of the pit, the trim edge of the page um, near the gutter. And it's that little red um, monospace type up there. Uh, or this half title page where he commissioned his wife's shorthand writing uh, to be used as the half title. Um, it's gorgeous, but illegible to most, um, probably. And this is actually, uh, it might be my favorite title page of the ones I've come across from him. Um, for a book of poems by George Oppen titled Alpine, he chose to add a comma after the title on the title page, which for me, it's a, it's a subtle move, um, but it, it's a move that pulls the reader forward into the book by using that simple linguistic device, right? It's, it's, it's saying this continues, turn this page. And uh, interestingly enough, this move feels contemporary to me because uh, of um, a design that comes to mind. Uh, this is by common name, um, the Even Magazine, they also used a comma in a similar way. Other examples of how many being ahead of his time can be seen in um, other places, like this instance where he letter spaces a long form setting of monospace typewriter style type. Uh, again, a real taboo in, in traditional type setting and design, but which I think actually turned out to be a super beautiful result. Um, here's a full spread of that letter spaced monospace. And here's a close up of that text. Or here in the typesetting scene on the left hand page, uh, it's an oversized light and sharp serif set fully justified with tight margins and tracking, awkward breaks with no hyphens, and the occasional little graphic symbol or icon sprinkled inline throughout the text. One could easily see how this style of typography could show up somewhere today. And I, again, I think he was really able to achieve this through that experimental mindset, through diving deep into um, playing with uh, the, the material that he knew so intimately. So while there's plenty of evidence in the world that supports the theory that creativity flourishes in social environments where ideas can be shared, it's hard not to see an argument for the flip side here in Hamidi's work. The Midwest specific life that Hamidi created for himself gave him what he needed, ample time and space in which he could dig deep in inside himself and his pursuits. He could get away from distractions where he could fully devote himself to his craft 
and invest countless hours to tedious and meticulous creative labor. It was within this production focused mindset, hyper aware of the passing of time where Hamidi dwelled. And I think it's where his inventiveness and creativity seem to thrive. So this last book I'll show is a special one. Hamidi himself described it as, quote, an absolute pedagogical necessity for the children of all well-to-do graphic designers. And on one hand is ostensibly a book of poems and paintings about different types of apples and nothing more. But on the other hand, below that surface, in its form and its structure and often its text, it's a book about how books come to be from seeds of ideas to ripen fruit. So it's a, a, it's a reflexive conceptual piece as well. Um, for instance, on several pages, the color bars and trim marks generated from the six color offset press used to print the paintings. Um, this was a, a, the production was a collaboration for Hamidi, um, which was rare. Um, those, those printer's marks are left intact as a way to emphasize the bookmaking process. Equally evident, although quieter, is the artifacts of Hamidi's production, handset type, printed on hand crank pr press on the handmade paper. So you have this juxtaposition of the kind of loud color um, advanced technology with this uh, traditional uh, technology and, and different approach. And I think it's a really beautiful contrast. <clears throat> So this is an excerpt from the text of that same book. Um, and it reads as follows. Someone once said that everything in the whole world is just waiting to become a book. Maybe this is true as there are books about everything in the world. And while this is like a simple, almost children's rhyme, um, I feel like Hamidi could have said this himself. Uh, there's a sense that he believed in books more than anything because he believed they could be anything. Um, if one actually believed in them enough. And I definitely think he did. Um, the production process of making a book was a deep experience for Hamidi, right? And I think he was able to um, translate that experience to, the, um, to the, the book itself as a product of that production. Um, and I think part of the, that thinking is summed up in this um, excerpt. It was from the same essay that I quoted earlier, um, the, the line about books being a Trojan horse for art. Um, so I'll read it. Uh, the book is a living dynamic possibility, a meeting place for whole worlds of divergent elements of human expression to melt and flow, to meld into excess beyond the limits of its parts. I mean, you can feel Hamidi's dedication and his investment in the thing that he does day in and day out, so much so that it makes me think about how he was able to reach a certain depth in his process, in his making process, um, being so involved necessarily, right, in terms of how much labor he had to put in to do small things. Um, how involved it was gave him this understanding of the process to where he respected the experience and understood the experience of making so deeply that he, it, it afforded him the ability to imbue that depth into the product itself being the book. And I think that was a virtuous cycle he found where the deeper he went in the process, the deeper he was able to achieve in the, the book itself and the product itself. And I think that was only achievable, that depth, through the life he made as a Midwestern artist and designer, um, as, a, as, a, as a Midwestern you know, person to create that time and space that I've mentioned throughout this talk. Um, and I think it's not just, you know, it's, it's concrete, like I said before, but I think it also is a mindset. And I, I really think that Hamidi demonstrated that to a really, again, awe-inspiring, inspirational way. And um, I find it um, that way, and I hope um, you all did too. So 
that sums up my, my talk. I've got one last slide, which is the image credits and acknowledgements. And thanks so much for joining. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing now. All right, thank you so much for that presentation, Adam. I'd like to invite our audience members, feel free to chime in with any questions of your own in the Q&A if you're here in Zoom or type it directly in the chat. And I see your message there, Judith and Anthony. Um, Thank you for attending as well. Um, I'll kick it off with the questions. We have about 10 minutes to just chat. Um, I noticed a little bit in your own um, final slide, it was sort of like a, your own version of the colophon of uh, Hamidi. Um, is that something that you incorporate into your own work as having these like longer explanatory colophons? You know, um, no, it hasn't been, um, but I'm intrigued by the possibility of it. Um, I don't think, you know, to be honest, actually, and I didn't, I haven't talked about this, is my undergrad was in creative writing, too, and actually poetry. So I understand the desire to use language and words as another material in the role of designer, printer, um, publisher. But I haven't gotten to the point where I necessarily want to go take the steps of making the call upon. I feel like I want to find my own type of avenue, right? Um, the yeah. call upon might still be that. Um, but yeah, I haven't done it yet, but I, that's a good comment about the last slide. I, I think um, I think sometimes the it feels like the colophon as a form gets forgotten um, and is kind of like an insider designer type of situation. And it's a little bit sad because it can be so meaningful, um, even when it is just the factual information. Um, it really can be... Um, uh, give a, a, a story in a way. So yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm talking myself into it a little bit. So I, <laughs> I, I think I, I'm curious about what it would mean to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess zooming out a little bit, one of the patterns I saw in Hamidi's work was really like, in response to what you were saying about like insider designer kind of thing, like the colophon being an insider designer kind of thing, uh, that also reminds me of the example with the printer's marks, right? That um, these are usually things that you wouldn't see unless you were a designer or a printer or something like that, but leaving them in for the reader was in some ways like lifting a little bit the curtain behind the curtain of what goes on in the print shop or in the designer studio. So as like a, I mean, I'm curious about that as like a larger principle um, in, in your design and in your work about like I guess, yeah, lifting the curtain behind the scenes or sort of making these things that are maybe part of the designers or the printer's process more legible in a way. Is yeah, that that, that's a great, that's a great question. I would say that the desire to make the process part of the end result um, through explicit nature or implicit nature um, to make the process more transparent overall, I think it is always a goal just because it can really elevate the understanding. Um, that being said, I think similar to what I was saying before, there's a fine line between doing that where people understand it and doing that where it just kind of gets in the way or it isn't understood or it isn't clear. Um, so I think the, um, yeah, it's again, it's, it's kind of like the, the, um, the rule of thumb of always wearing my designer hat, which is essentially asking the question, okay, is this appropriate? Is this the right place to do this? Will it uh, impede or impose or obtrude in some way that would hurt the content or would it help the content and would it support it in some way? So I think, you know, how many had the opportunity because he worked so, his collaborations with artists and writers um, poets were so close. Um, the books he made were always really, really kind of, it was almost fluid in regard, at least from what it seemed, it was almost fluid in regard to what his role was and who he was as an author and how he helped their voice come through. It wasn't like, okay, I'm the, I'm the designer, just send me a Word doc and I'll set it and, and design the thing. So it was like, I think it was a constant conversation and understanding on everyone's part as a team to know that this book was going to be a joint creative expression with Hamidi's voice in it throughout. We have an audience question from Tyler. 
request. Can you restate why you think comedy might be contradictory in making exclusive, highly crafted objects? Did he also claim subscribe to those eight tenets of portable, universal, etc. that you listed? Good job. Uh, I mean, sorry, I'm reading. Um, the, thanks, thanks, Tyler. Yeah, good question. Um, so he, uh, the contradictory nature is based on the fact that um, what Hamidi was making, even though he, um, even though he subscribed to the idea of the artist book being a Trojan horse, which to me has to do with the ability for the content in that horse, right? The, the ideas in that horse to be distributed to an audience that might not um, know they're receiving art, right? Like they might not know they're receiving those ideas because they're just picking up a book and flipping it open and reading it and not, and it's this, it's a different mode of reception than looking at a painting or, or reading a poem even. That being said, I think his, all of his books were highly regarded and precious art objects. They were rare. They were, you picked one up and you knew it was, it was fragile and that runs against contrary to the most important tenets in my opinion of artist books, which is what Pat Steer talks about, which is something that is accessible, something that is cheap to produce, something that's cheap to disseminate, something that is robustly built that can be thrown around and passed around and is ephemeral essentially, right? Is, is something that just about getting the ideas conveyed as easily and as smoothly as possible without the friction of it feeling or being received as an art object. So I think there's, there's a contradiction there that I found in Hamidi's work, um, whether he, you know, it, it raises the question in my mind, it's like, what would Hamidi do if he did, rather than had a letterpress as his kind of tool of choice, if it was a risograph or if it was something that is built to be about duplication or about, um, you know, quantity rather than fine quality. So that's, I hope that answers your question, Todd. Yeah, like extending that conjecture even more, like even like what if he had access to digital, right? And just like very easy uh, reproduction, right? Would some of these things um, that really have to do with like showing the craft and the handmade nature of this, like how would that still play through as a theme if he had access to these different tools? Yeah, I, I, I wish Ruth was able to speak. I know Ruth, I saw her comment. I'm so glad Ruth, you could make it. This is, um, I, I wish you could speak to that question because I don't know Walter at all, but he definitely did have access to digital tools. He just chose not to use them, at least in his bookmaking, right? Or at least he chose not to use them most of the time. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good kind of like thought, um, a thought experiment. Anthony has a question, I think that's turning back to you. Um, do you find yourself making more in the influence to the Midwestern style of design since being located here? And if so, has your opinion of creating precious work changed? Um, good question, Anthony, thank you. Um, so I wouldn't, I would steer clear of a style per se. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a Midwestern style to the points I tried to make in the talk, I would say there's potentially a Midwestern mindset and space, mind space that one can achieve through what this place can afford you, which is more time and space. So it's almost like um, that depth might produce a style, it might produce a design approach, it might produce a formal treatment or even concepts or ideas. But I think the difference there is that it's free of various constraints or it has different types of constraints here that would allow one to, um, to find that depth. Now, to your question of um, design since being located here and if uh, your opinion of creating precious work has changed. My opinion of creating precious work has changed not because of the place, but more because of my continued just um, 
investment in what it means to be making print work. Um, I don't, I don't want to make, um, personally, I don't want to make precious objects, whether I do still want to make things that are beautiful and that people respect as objects. Um, but I'm much more interested in those objects being um, conveying ideas. And I think books are one of the best forms to do that for a number of reasons. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's how I, my opinion about those things have shifted. Awesome. And we have our final question from Rachel. Do you imagine Hamidi had a good sense of humor? There's something really fun, sometimes it's funny about his design choices. And the moment you see what's happening, it's like magic, but without the trickery. Great, great comment and question, Rachel. Um, I didn't talk about Hamidi's humor at all. I chose not to just based on the length of the talk. I could have probably dedicated and people may have before to Hamidi's humor for a whole talk. It, it, he had a, a very distinctive type of humor that was involved, right? It wasn't slapstick, it wasn't in your face, except there was a certain type of playfulness and whimsicalness to his formal choices. But his humor often came through, for me, it came through a lot of the writing and subtler moves that you had to spend time with his work to really get. And, um, but yeah, I mean, he was, he was, definitely quirky um and the the your comment about it like being magic and trickery that's really interesting because i keep thinking of him um as kind of like this magician or as kind of like this person who operated not on the same plane as everyone <laughs> like he really had this ability to when he was doing his thing with his books he was able to access a world of yeah trickster magic um that um yeah it ended up into these magic documents that ended up being booked so uh yeah i agree all right well thanks for those questions everybody and adam thanks again for that presentation we have another edition of One Designer, One Work coming up next month as part of our ongoing monthly series. So stay tuned for that. Follow us at AIGA.org, get on our mailing list or on social media at AIGA Design on all of the social medias, um, all the usual ones. And I'm Lee Sean Huang. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. We'll see you next month. All right. Bye, everyone.